this is my theory for the screenwriting process that goes into these series scripts. They get a first draft with the basic story and they say, okay, how do we make this in terms of dialogue and visuals as disgusting and appalling as possible? Then they take that draft and say, okay, how do we make this episode as awesome as possible? When I first heard about Gen V and then I saw the trailer, kind of assumed that it was just going to be a holdover between The Boys Season 3 and The Boys Season 4. Above average, maybe interesting, but nothing more than that. Then I watched the first episode. And then I watched the next two episodes. And it completely surpassed my expectations. Yes, if you watch The Boys and you understand its themes and its universe, it will augment your viewing experience. But even if you haven't, this show is more than a companion to the series. It stands alone on its own, and it's incredible thus far. The writers behind these series understand classic character development and composition. But they take it a step further. They lure you in with interesting setups, but then not only do they follow up with natural and organic fleshing out of these characters, but they keep you guessing as to the characters' true motivations, intentions, and what's going on with their psyche. You have a general idea, but you don't really know, and at no point can you really guess what their next move is, nor can you really complain if it's something you didn't expect. This may seem like an odd comparison, but Stranger Things has ha always had this quirk, where they introduce a character that's quickly identifiable as obnoxious and one-dimensional, and then they pull a 180 and lure you into the character in like one episode, and suddenly you love and care about them and empathize with them and you want to see them survive through the story and you want to see what happens to them. At one time it had its charm but it's lost its quirk and it's lost its luster. The writers behind this series not only understand good character composition and character identification but they understand the slow burn of character development. They know how to lure you in and keep you guessing as to what these characters' motivations are by keeping you ping-ponging back and forth as to whether you can trust a character, whether you like a character, whether you hate a character, whether you even know what a character is about, whether a character is going to be there for the whole ride or if they're going to be killed off in an instant. They know how to set up these characters so well that they feel like real people by the time you're through with the episode. So thus far I've been speaking to the strengths of both The Boys and Gen V, but now we're going to switch gears full on reviewing Gen V. I'm fresh off the cuff from the first three episodes, but whenever I first started watching, I was asking or guessing, uh, okay, this guy might be the Homelander guy, this guy might be the fill-in for A-Train, this person might be the Starlight alternative. But by the as the episode went on, I came to I, I had to stop guessing. Like the scenes were just like jolting me with surprises, and by the end of the first episode, I just stopped guessing. There's no point because these characters have been written in such a way that they demand your respect as individual characters with a unique dynamic that separates itself from the boys and what they've got going on. Thus far, every scene serves a clear purpose. And whatever suspense or dilemma or conflicts are being set up in the scene, there's always a payoff. Whether that payoff is mystery or if that payoff is resolve, there's always payoff. And it keeps you guessing as to what these characters are doing. It's these interactions and these conversations that covertly lure you in through the show's incredible pacing. There's shoddy pacing, there's fast pacing, there's slow pacing, there's solid pacing, and then there's magic pacing. The way this show seamlessly flows through the scenes, the minute you become slightly bored, it organically transitions to a new scene that isn't some new setup or some new twist. It calls back to something you already forgot you were interested in. The pacing is so well, there's no other way to describe it except for impeccable. There's no filler, there's no beating around the bush, and any time you think the setup for a scene or story beat is going to go a familiar direction, it diverts and goes in an unexpected direction without introducing new plot twists or characters that haven't already been introduced in the show. In so doing, you become attached to every single scene. 
Because in the first episode, there is so much set up, so many characters, so many story beats, so much is hit in that first episode. And because you didn't see all these plot points coming, and you're attached to every scene, you can get lost following the story, but there's clinical, but needed and fast-paced exposition that's included without overstaying its welcome to help you connect the dots so this magic pacing that I've been praising can stay consistent and keep you alert in and compelled. It just gives you what you need to know and then it just keeps on going. So clearly the show setting, a university for soups, is somewhat of a homage and allusion to X-Men, you know, Xavier's School for the Gifted. Uh, but that being said, it feels like its own university and only in premise alone is it an illusion. There's only one character that I could call back to a uh, X-Men character, and that's Rogue. There's a character in this show who's similar to Rogue, can't touch people, because when Rogue would touch people, at least in the movies, uh, when Rogue would touch people, she would drain their life force, so she couldn't touch them. This character, it's a little hazy, I'll admit. This character is able to touch people and then influence their minds. She's telepathic, apparently she's called an empath and she can influence their behaviors and thoughts. I will admit it's a little hazy because sometimes she wears gloves as if she can't touch anyone but then there are scenes where she doesn't. I don't think that's an, a mistake. It's just a little hazy as to whether or not her powers are under complete control. But we're also learning things about her slowly that compel us to continue questioning what her true motivations and intentions are, what her actual psyche is. There are scenes that you don't even know whether she's being genuine or she's being dishonest. And if she's genuine, is she, is she being a bad person? And if she's dishonest, is she being a good person by lying to someone and protecting them? I don't know. It's the only element of any of these characters that I find hazy. But honestly, the character is written so well and has such an interesting connection to the mystery. I really don't care. Now let me talk about the acting. I don't really have time to go into every single character and the act, the respective actor's performance, but I do want to briefly discuss Jas Sinclair as Marie Moreau. This acting is absolutely superb. She is able to fluctuate from angry to heartbroken to unhinged to sad and not only is she able to act with her body and her lines, but she's able to act with her face. She's able to hold her face in these natural ways that when she's crying or when she's angry, it doesn't seem like a performance. It seems like this is what she's feeling. And she's really the only character that you know everything about, at least we're led to believe we know everything about. And she's still able to keep you guessing as what her psyche is going on based on her performance alone. I mean, the writing, I'm sure helps but her performance is done so is so good that as with the other characters you're always guessing at her motivations and true intentions even though you know where she comes from you know her backstory not only must she fluctuate between what has the potential for what's obviously going to be a larger than life character a superhero or villain however it goes uh but she has to also portray this naively hopeful young woman who's entering this university with these unfortunate circumstances. And her ability to go back and forth, that's difficult enough. But one task is giving a, a performance that conveys the underdog story, but the flip side of it. Most underdog stories in film and TV follow a character who comes from unfortunate circumstances, a difficult background, all the odds are stacked against them, and early in the narrative, they see their circumstances as a weakness, and then they come to embrace who they are, and they embrace their status as the underdog, and then they come to view it as a strength, and and embrace it as a strength, and that's how they triumph over uh, their shortcomings early in life. So, that's all fun and well. People can get in, into that, people can relate to that, you know, the triumph of the human spirit. It's not really a flip on the underdog story. It's a it's a realistic view of the underdog story. From early on, she already sees herself as an underdog, and she already embraces it as a strength and, and 
how it's given her drive and determination to become one of the seven, to become a superhero, to get a city contract and protect a city. But as she comes to the university and so much happens and she learns, she slowly learns a little bit of the truth of how this works. Then she comes to see her unfortunate, unfortunate circumstances as a weakness, but not in the same way that underdogs and other movies have. She comes to see them as, hmm, it's just a matter of reality that my circumstances and backstory are just going to make it very difficult for me here. But then so much major stuff happens in the first episode, she kind of has a road paved for her. She has the opportunity to further her career. And it's interesting because other characters who you totally empathize with uh, after this stuff happens come to her asking her for help uh, with her newfound status, how she can use it to help them further their goals and their investigation of what's going on, uh, help them gain their recognition that they deserve. You totally empathize with them whenever they are asking her these things, whenever they're requesting these tasks. But whenever she throws it back in their face and she says, look, here's the thing. I have these unfortunate circumstances and I have this backstory and you don't know me. You have all these fallbacks in your back pocket. Some of them have more than others, but still they all have more of an ability to return home to still seek a life worth living. She's got one chance. And now that she's got what's admittedly an ingenuine and plastic road to a career to be fruitful, you completely understand when she says, it's not my problem. I'm going on with this. Whenever she starts reading from the script and doing what Vought, or well, not Vought, but what her supervisors, her managers at the university are doing for her. And that's so compelling because either choice she makes, you understand. And you don't know what choice she's going to make. With the three episodes that have been released thus far, even though that she's a character you know the most about, She's also the character that you really don't have any idea where her arc is going to go. And that's what's so compelling about her. And her performance elevates it to this absolutely compelling level. And what's so interesting about this character and all these characters and their dreams of being a part of the Seven or being a part of one of Vault's reality shows or competitive shows or, one, or their drama movies or superhero movies is that even though if you've seen The Boys, you know Vault is not only a sham, but they're evil and corrupt, and any morally decent person should not be a part of it and would suffer to be a part of the Seven or or all this Vault uh, merchandise and, and corporatism. But you still want to see them achieve those goals and dreams, even even though you know it's not in their best interest. Because these are the youth in this universe. In this universe, you can understand why in a socio-political -polit climate that sort of mirrors ours without the superheroes, obviously. Um, you can understand why they have these dreams and goals. And it actually kind of keeps you, makes you wonder, would they be better off seeking what is kind of a plastic career, was kind of a plastic purpose with Vault? or returning home to these issues that they have no matter what they do. If I had to nitpick at all, there are a couple times so far where a character or characters will hastily make a choice to do something incredulous or dangerous or risky based on information recently discovered that clearly is just scratching the surface. But like I said before, the pacing is done so well and the character is done so well that I really don't care. If the rest of this series ends up being a companion to the boys, or if it's going to get more seasons, or if it's going to tie into the boys, or if it's just a one-shot deal, I really don't care because it's just that awesome and I'm in for the full ride. This is Poisoned Apple Attack of the Screen. Thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, whole shindig.